Welcome back to another week of hashtag Ask Firebase. I'm David, and this week I'm ready to fire up some questions. Whew. It's actually got fire in the can. So this week we got a lot of great questions, and if you want your question answered, make sure to send it in using the hashtag Ask Firebase. So let's dive into what's in store this week. Do I smell smoke? No, wait, it's a question. So our first question comes from YouTube by Nick. And Nick asks, when will it be possible to set the notification payload properties in the console? You can do it today. All you have to do is go to the Firebase console at console.firebase.google.com. And then once you click on the notifications tab, create a new message and then scroll down to the bottom and you'll see an advanced options tab and that will open up. And from there you can see a custom data section and this is where you can set your payload properties. So Nick, all you have to know to set these payload properties, you just go to the console and it's an advanced options. Great question, Nick. <coughs> all the smoke, so smoky. <coughs> Time for another question. Chris asks, would there be a noticeable performance hit if I was to call firebase.database multiple times rather than storing it in a variable? And that's a really good question, Chris. You don't really have to worry about it because firebase.database returns a singleton. If you don't know what a singleton is, it's just a fancy way of saying it's the same object every time you call that function. So you can store it in a variable or you can just call firebase.database. Not something you have to worry about. You can just go build your app and be happy. Firebase, now in a can. <laughs> so our next question was actually asked multiple times. So on Twitter, Francisco asked this, and on YouTube, Anderson asked this. Can you do a tutorial on best practices on how to organize and structure your data so you can do complex queries, especially if you're coming from a SQL background? Well, we actually have some content in the pipeline that's going to show you some equivalent SQL queries to Firebase calls. But if you're eager to learn today, we have an earlier blog post that talks about just doing that. So it has some SQL queries and it has the Firebase function calls and compares them together. So if you want to see that, the link for that is in the description. So great question to you, Francisco and Anderson. So this next question comes from Mousem on Twitter. Mousem asks, I have two different environments, QA and prod. Do I need two different user logins for the real-time database for each environment? So Mousem, imagine if one of your environments was fire. So you would just go and Okay, well, maybe another analogy. So the main problem with this is that you have a lot of QA data or development data and you actually have your production app. And a lot of times you don't want to pollute the two. So you wanna keep all that information nicely isolated. And the way you do that is through your build process. So it doesn't matter what platform you're on, whether it's web, Android, or iOS, it all comes down to your build process. So the first step you need to do is go to the Firebase console. And if you're on Android or iOS, you have to make a new app inside of the console. So one will be your QA app App, and one will be your production app. And then from there in your build process, you create a specific build that will target that QA app and a specific build that will target the production app. So if you're on web, you don't need to create an app, but you just need to provide a different hash map of your config values, which is really easy to swap in and out. And then on Android, you just create different build flavors. So you have a build flavor for your development or QA app that has a different Google services JSON file. And then on iOS, rather Rather than having a build flavor, you just use a different target that will specify a different plist. So a plist for the QA or a dev environment and a plist for the production environment. All you have to know is if you're going to have two different environments, you're going to need to use the two different builds to set up each environment. So let's cook up another question. Tim on Twitter asks, is there a way to authenticate with other OAuth2 providers outside of Facebook, Google, Twitter, and GitHub using Firebase authentication? Well. Tim. Anything that is not supported out of the box, like the ones you specified, you can use our custom authentication. So custom authentication requires you to run your own server, but we provide you with server SDKs that allow you to create a token based upon a UID and some claims that you create to mint this token. So if you want to authenticate with your own backend or any OAuth2 provider, you can do that with these server SDKs. And if you want to see an example of that, you should check out 
last week's Ask Firebase where we actually talk about that in one of the questions. And if you wanna get started, check out our documentation, which is in the links. Great question, Tim. Do we have another question? <laughs> yeah, we do. Bavir on Twitter asks, how can I enable only certain nodes in the Firebase database for offline support? The way that offline support works with the Firebase database is that you call set persistence enabled and then everything just works. Now, there is a cache size that is set to 10 megabytes, which sounds low, but that's a ton of JSON data. As your data starts to grow beyond this 10 megabyte threshold, we take less used data from the cache and just evict it. So if you're not really using it, we're gonna evict it and keep the cache size at a good level. But sometimes you wanna make sure that a node is always synced. So even if you're hitting up against that cache size, you don't want it to be evicted. And for those purposes, you can use the keep synced method. So keep synced is available on a reference. So you create a reference and call keep synced and it will always be in the cache. So Bavir, all you have to know is just call set persistence enabled. And if you really want to make sure that data is always in the cache, call keep synced. So great question. I need my life with coffee. <laughs> So this last question comes from Dominic on Twitter. And Dominic asks, in my security rules, everyone should be able to read the data, but only admin users should be able to write. So how do I do that? What you need to do is create a white list of admins in the database. So that could just be a node for slash admins, and then each one of the admins is contained within that list. And at that point, when you're writing your security rules, you can say everyone can read, but for that write clause, you say anyone who wants to write has to belong in that admin list. And in one of our previous Firecasts, we actually covered just this. So you should go and check that out. The link is in the description. So that's all the questions for this week. Thank you all so much for sending them in. And if you wanna see your question answered, make sure to go on Twitter, YouTube, Stack Overflow, wherever really, and just ask a question with the hashtag Ask Firebase. So like I said, that's all for this week, but tune in next week where we're actually going to be answering live questions from AndDevCon. And right now, I really, really need some coffee. Is that a chicken? It's a chicken. I know it's a chicken.